This is Bob Oliphant from the Westford Historical Society and Museum bringing you episode 42 of the Westford Wardsman podcast. The Westford Wardsman newspaper was part of Turner's Public Spirit, a weekly newspaper in air a century ago. In this episode, we'll be reading The Wardsman for the week ending Saturday, October 17th, 1908. I'll add commentary to elaborate on what was happening in Westford 114 years ago. The first section in the October 17th paper is the Westford Center section. The early morning train and the last train at night, which is such a convenience to many all the time and to nearly everybody else occasionally, continues to run as heretofore, and much satisfaction is expressed by the township and much grateful appreciation to the town clerk, Edward Fisher, for time and effort expended by him as far as the town is concerned. You might recall that they were going to change the schedule for that train, and the petition was uh, put together opposing that, and apparently the, the uh, trolley company listened to them. Dr. and Mrs. Henry L. McCluskey and son Donald of Worcester are spending a week in town, the guests of Deacon and Mrs. A.S. Wright. From here, they go to Lynn for the sessions of the State uh, Christian Endeavor Convention. Dr. McCluskey is one of the officers of the State Union. Mr. and Mrs. Alfred W. Hartford are to move into the new house on Depot Street, being built by Frank Drew as soon as it is ready for occupancy. John Hartford, the popular morning conductor on our branch line, is on duty again after enjoying a week's vacation. Miss Lenny Fletcher was a weekend guest of Mrs. O.R. Spaulding's. Reverend Frank M. Baker, who is staying at John P. Wright's, preached at the Sunday evening service at the Congregational Church to an attentive, attentive and good-sized audience. Mrs. Lillian and May Atwood are attending the sessions of the American Board of Foreign Missions, convened at Brooklyn, New York, October 13th through the 17th. The annual business meeting of the Women's Christian Temperance Union was held at Mrs. Harmon's Wednesday afternoon. After the election of officers, Mrs. Hildreth gave a good account of the county convention held at Concord and the state convention at Lowell, both of which she attended. There will be a parlor meeting Tuesday afternoon, October 20th, at the home of Miss Ida E. Layton. The following officers were elected. President, Mrs. Jenny Hildreth. First Vice President, Mrs. Ada A. Day. Second Vice President, Mrs. Alice M. Lambert. Secretary, Mrs. Emma Day. Treasurer, Mrs. Harmon. The next uh, section is called Grange Visitation. Fully 60 patrons of Westford Grange attended by special invitation the neighbor's night at Carlisle Wednesday evening. Two large two-horse barges, other outfits with two horses, and many with single horses conveyed the visiting members. Lexington and Chelmsford were the other Granges invited, as well as a few from Concord and Billerica. The entertaining Grange was fully equal to the occasion with its hearty welcome its beautifully decorated hall with trophies of the harvest, and the bountiful supper served to all. The three visiting granges furnished a program that was heartily appreciated. Westford's chair, share was as follows. The Grange Orchestra, Messrs. Fletcher, Blodgett, and Miller, a vocal solo by, uh, I believe it's Edgar G. Boynton, duet by F.A. Smith and Mrs. S.B. Wright, and a reading by Mrs. Arthur Blodgett, vocal solo, Ruth Miller, with piano and violin accompaniment by Mabel and Everett Miller. A range of neighbors' nights were quite frequent, and Westford would, would visit other Grangers in the area, and they would invite other Grangers in the area to visit them. Uh, the next section is called Tadmuck. It was October's brightest and bluest weather Tuesday afternoon for the opening meeting of the fourth season of the Tadmont Club. The ladies of the Unitarian Society were the hostesses for the day, and the ladies' parlors, which have been thoroughly renovated during the summer, were thoroughly, thoroughly comfortable and pretty, and made more so by bright autumn flowers arranged under the direction of Mrs. H. V. Hildreth. The opening remarks of the president, Miss Sarah W. Loker. Uh, Sarah Loker was um, 
actually the founder of the Tadmuck Club four years previously. Uh, the opening remarks of, the, of Ms. Loker were in a vein of happy felicity and sincerity and expressed confidence in the continued unity of purpose and loyalty to the best interests of the club. Ms. Loker stated that the trustees of the library, where the regular meetings are held, had granted the use of the trustees' room as a cloakroom. It was Tadmuck Day, the old Indian name of our town, and much of interest was told from the town's first settling on through the years up to the present time, much of great interest to the older ones and of great instruction to the, to the younger element. Mrs. Benjamin H. Bailey, Miss C. S. Atwood, uh, Carrie Atwood, Miss E. F. Fletcher were the committee in charge. Mrs. George T. Day gave the first paper, giving a splendid account of the town's early history, of which she is such a thorough student. Miss Miranda G. Luce gave an outline of the social life, which was thoroughly bright and interesting, making plain that the life in earlier days was not all toil and hardship, but was brightened with dancing and singing school husking with dancing and singing school huskings barn raisings and sewing circles miss caroline e hewitt gave the third paper paper sketching the early history of the historic neshoba district most attractively the papers were interest interspersed with some fine old-time music by mrs carrie s atwood Ruth Fisher, Laura Lumbert, Eva Fletcher, and Mrs. Mrs. C.D. Colburn, with Mrs. Charles A. Marshall accompanist. Such stirring old tunes as Russia, Strike the Symbol, Invitation, Cousin Jedediah, and Old Lang Syne were given. The various papers were illustrated with many photographs and Old China loaned by Mrs. Hiram Whitney, Mrs. E.J. Whitney, and others. It'd be nice to read some of those old papers, I would think. The next section is about town. At the recent Middlesex North Agricultural Fair, Samuel L. Taylor was awarded first premium on Baldwin apples. Even thus, and he's the one that's writing this, by the way, even thus was it deemed equity to decide that apples that are puffed up enough in their own estimation to measure 12 inches in circumference should be rewarded for their dry weather attainments. Grateful remembrance to correspondence on, on to the correspondent on Tadmuck Hilltop from the Valley correspondent for her clear and startling description of the habits and habitations of the surroundings of Paradise Spring. Let me see, dogwood, poison ivy, woodchucks, rattlesnakes, tax collector. Oh my, shan't go near that combination. The public town committee held a meeting at the selectman's room last week Friday evening and transacted business that elected Judge Taft president. The Gilman J. Wright place on Depot Street, that was at number 9 Depot Street, has been sold to Mrs. Mary E. Brigham. The registrars of voters will hold a meeting at Healy's Hall, Graniteville, on Monday evening, October 19th, at Abbott's Hall, Forge Village, Wednesday evening, October 21st, at Town Hall, last meeting, prior to election, Saturday, October 24th, from noon until 10 o'clock. The personal property of the late Dr. Walter J. Sleeper will be sold at auction Saturday, October 24th at 1 p.m., rain or shine. You may recall Dr. Sleeper, a Westford doctor, passed away on August 12, 1908. Water and milk, which have spells of having a bad name owing to bad company, are getting inconveniently scarce. The H.E. Fletcher Granite Company, who have several contracts on hand requiring the running of all the machinery are obliged to car the water from Stony Brook. Uh, when they say car the water, I mean they mean to carry it by a water tanker um, car on the railroad. This requires frequent repetition as the steam compressor requires 94,000 gallons of water daily. Many of the farmers on Francis Hill and elsewhere are hauling water from Stony Brook and by some source or another will have to precipitate water into Stony Brook in order to get some out. As a connecting link between forestry, rainfall, 
rainfall, and evaporation, it might be well to record the signs of the times and say that Chairman Oscar Spaulding of the Board of Selectmen has been introducing the past week a representative of the State Forestry Bureau with a view to setting out wasteland of the town to forest trees. Now, don't let us all stubbornly assume the attitude of a cannon and hold this movement up. If we do well, if we do, we all ought to be fired off, and then, just like as not, it would rain. We should note that the Spalding Town Forest, named after Oscar Spalding, is located on both sides of Cold Spring Road, just north of the intersection with Forge Village Road. Oscar Spalding uh, owned several tracts of woodland in Westford and was noted uh, as somewhat of a, a uh, lumberman himself. Uh, the next section is the Forge Village section. Word has just received from William Orange, who enlisted in 1906 in Company Q, the 11th U.S. Infantry, now stationed at Fort Russell, Wyoming. He had just returned from a 17 days and nights practice march through ice and snow when he received the letter from his sister saying that his father, Abraham Orange, had met with an accidental death by drowning on September 25th. It was such a shock to him so far away from home that he was ill for several days. His brother Joseph is on the USS Vermont, now on the way to Japan. No letters can be received for two months as they are so far away. The battleship Vermont was laid down in, 19, in May 1904 at Quincy uh, Mass uh, Four River Shipbuilding Company and was commissioned at the Boston Navy Yard on March 4, 1907. It was a member of the globe-circling crews of the United States Atlantic Fleet, nicknamed the Great White Fleet, because of their white paint schemes. Uh, the 16 pre-dreadnought battleships sailed from Hampton Roads, Virginia, on December 16th, um, 1907, and stood out to sea under the gaze of President Theodore Roosevelt, who had commissioned this trip around the globe as a dramatic gesture toward uh, Japan, who he recognized as a growing power on the world stage. The Vermont, the Vermont visited ports in Chile, Peru, Mexico, California, Hawaii, New Zealand, Australia, the Philippines, Japan, China, and in the Mediterranean before she returned to Hampton Roads again, passing in review before President Roosevelt on Washington's birthday, February 22, 1909. That must have been quite an experience for all the sailors of the Great White Fleet, including one from Westford. You can read more about this in the Dictionary of American Fighting Ships, which is available online at www.hazegray.org. The members of the John Edwards Hose Company had a tryout Saturday afternoon. All the hydrants were found in good order. The new hose carriage has been removed from the Abbott barn to the new hose house. Preparations are underway to furnish the clubhouse. Probably the oldest campaign flag in the town of Westford was unfurled to the breeze on Wednesday at the home of Mrs. H.E. Randall. The flag did duty during the War of 1861 and contains 42 stars. Uh, the 42nd state was not admitted to the Union until Washington was admitted to the Union in 1889. So if this was a U.S. flag with 42 stars, it, it, was, it doesn't date from the Civil War. The next state admitted to the Union was on July 3rd, 1890, uh, only uh, a year later. So the 42-star flag uh, wasn't used for very long. Probably the number of stars was reported incorrectly. Civil War flags would have 34 to 36 stars. Uh, the, the article goes on to say that many bullet holes are visible in this flag. Mrs. Randall has had it in her position for more than 20 years. The annual parish meeting of the Episcopal Church was held, held at the vicarage at Ayer Monday evening. Reverend T. L. Fisher, Thomas L. Fisher, no, I'm sorry, it's not... Thomas, I don't think. Reverend T.L. Fisher entertained our village choir. After supper was served, Mr. Tur Sturgis, the treasurer of the parish, read the report of all the missions. Groton, Shirley, and Woodville were well represented. It was announced at the meeting that St. Andrew's mission of this village was clear of debt. 
After the business meeting was over, a social hour was enjoyed. Also, a light lunch was served. Mrs. Lucretia Reed, Mrs. Mary Drake, and Alvin S. Bennett attended the funeral of their brother-in-law, Bryant McIntyre, who met his death by falling off a load of hay, breaking his neck, Sunday at Shrewsbury. Mrs. Alice L. Prescott, who teaches in school in Ashland, New Hampshire, has been visiting her parents, Mr. and Mrs. Nelson Prescott, for a few days. Miss Stella Karkin has accepted a position with the FC Church Insurance Company, commencing her duties last Monday. So FC Church has been around for a long time, well over 100 years. The next section is the Graniteville section. Court Graniteville, Foresters of America, held a very successful dancing party in Westford Town Hall last week Friday evening, which was well attended. Many being present from Ayer, Forge Village, Littleton, and the usual loud, large crowd from Graniteville and Westford Center. Dancing was enjoyed from 8 until 12 o'clock with a short intermission at 10.30 when refreshments were served in the lower hall. The dance was in charge of the following efficient committee. T. A. Riney, manager, assisted by D. W. Harrington, Fred Defoe, A. R. Wall, R. J. Heeman, Hibbard's or Orchestra of Lowell furnished excellent music for dancing and helped in a great measure toward the social success of the affair. The book contest, which has been going on here for the past few weeks, closed the latter part of last week and the following awards have been made. Sofa Pillow, won by Angeline Brisson. Rose Jar to Charles Gardet. Umbrella to Jenny Ledwith. Water Set to Fred Hosmer. Water set to Mrs. Louisa Riney. Clock to J.H. Payne. Watch chain to Mrs. D. Lorenzo. Watch to Charles Couture. Sofa pillow to Hannah Coburn, Forge Village. Bert de Rhone, who has been at Lake Sunapee, New Hampshire for the past few weeks, has been a recent visitor in this building, in this village. The reopening of the Methodist Episcopal Church in Graniteville, which has been looked forward to with such deep interest by the village people for the past few weeks, took place at 1045 Sunday morning and was largely attended. The church has been closed for several weeks for the purpose of making extensive repairs and alterations. The carpenters, painters, and decorators have been kept busy, and as a result, the church edifice at present is in fine condition, both from a practical and artistic point of view. According to a uh, previous uh, Westford Wardsman article of September 19, 1908, the Graniteville contractor P. Henry Harrington and his men began extensive repairs on the Methodist Church in mid-September. The work included the building of steps, fixing up the belfry, and several minor repairs. So the completion of that work is what they're celebrating. The opening service was conducted by Reverend S. H. Armand, A-R-M-A-N-D, who was ably assisted by Reverend M. H. A. Evans, who was the first pastor of the church. He served the church from 1869 to 71 and from 1876 to 1879. And Reverend Armand was the current pastor of the Methodist Church, that is the 1908 pastor. The choir, which was augmented for the occasion and under the direction of Mrs. C. H. Wright, with Miss Emily Prynne as organist, acquitted themselves with credit, the anthem being particularly pleasing. The solo, Face to Face, as sung by Mrs. Armand, was a rare treat, she being an excellent voice. There were remarks by the pastor, followed by singing by the choir. At this sermon, at this service, the sermon was preached by Dr. C. F. Rice, district superintendent, who spoke from Acts 26, verse 19, quote, Whereupon, O King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision, end quote. Dr. Rice, Rice spoke in his usual forceful manner, his sermon being listened to very attentively by the large congregation present. His words made a deep impression on his hearers, and the closing remarks of his sermon left something to be long remembered. This service was attended by many former parishioners, parishioners from out of town. 
The Love Feast service, held from 6 to 7, was conducted by Reverend Alfred Woods, a former pastor here. He also served at two different pastorates, the first from 1879 to 82, and the second from 1888 to 91. He is now of Berryport. Mr. Woods is always a welcome visitor here, and it is needless to say this service was largely attended and proved to be highly interesting to his former per parishioners. Um, Alfred Woods was from uh, Halifax, Nova Scotia, and he came to Boston to s become a, a minister at Boston University, and he served our church for while well, he was doing that in 1879 to 82. And he was quite popular. He would return uh, quite often uh, to preach at the Methodist Church. At the evening service, commencing at 7 o'clock, the sermon was preached by Reverend John Alfonso Day, also a former pastor, uh, 1900 and 1901, now of Ashburnham. Dr. Day gave a very able sermon and spoke of his pleasant recollections of his pastorate here. The full choir was in attendance at this service, and the singing, if anything, was of a more elaborate order than at the morning service. Dr. Day is not related to the days of uh, Westford at all. The village was thronged with visitors from out of town, many of whom had come quite a long distance to participate in the services on the opening of the church. The evening service was a fitting climax to a very eventful day. And that's the news in Westford for the week ending October 17th, 1908. Thank you for listening, and thanks to Nick Woodbury of Westford Cat for providing technical support. You can find transcriptions from the Wardsman at the Westford Historical Society's website at museum.westford.org or visit the Historical Society's Facebook page for more Westford news from a century ago. This is Bob Oliphant, and I hope you will join us for next week's Westford Wardsman podcast. Thank you.